We're now getting the live stream ready and we are live. If you're just joining us, you're probably watching on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or on our website. This is the Bite Back Tour for the San Gabriel Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District. Today, we are in the city of Azusa. And let's do a quick round of introductions. My name is Levy Sun, and I'll go around my circle here. Um, go ahead, Pablo. Hi, my name is Pablo Cabrera, and I'm the communication specialist here at the district. All right, Christian. Hi, everyone. My name is Christian Luna, and I am the education specialist at the San Gabriel Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District. And finally, Ali. Hi, everyone. My name is Ali Gaspar, and I'm the outreach assistant here at the district. Very cool. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, this is the Bite Back Tour in the city of Azusa. If you have any questions, any comments, please feel free to put them in the chat anywhere that is on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook. If you're watching on our website, we have a form right below. Go ahead and submit a question. I'll be monitoring for any questions that come through our site. So let's kick things off. Um, big news. This past week, we actually confirmed West Nile virus from a dead crow that was collected in the city of South Pasadena. Now, just want to put it out there, just because the bird was found in Pasadena or South Pasadena doesn't mean that it's only there. Many of us who talk about finding these positive birds uh, for West Nile virus, we know that birds, um, mosquitoes, and the viruses they may carry don't care about city borders. So the finding of this dead crow was just an indication of West Nile virus circulating in the wider region. Um, so for a lot of people, it was quite surprising to hear that, um, especially this late into the year. Normally, we would probably see some virus activity by May or even April, but this year it's a little later. Um, but nonetheless, West Nile virus is out there. So what to do, what to do? Um, definitely not going to panic mode. I mean, you can panic if you so choose, but there are steps that we can all take to protect ourselves. And... Because we live in the city, we cannot get rid of 100% of mosquitoes. There are ways to minimize them, but there are definitely ways to prevent them from biting us. And that's using repellent. Um, just gonna throw it out there then. Maybe Ali, you can answer this. What kind of repellents should people even look for? Thanks, lady. Yeah, I can totally answer that. Um, people should be looking mainly for the four main ingredients, which are, um, oil of lemon eucalyptus, also known as PMD, DEET, the keratin, and IR 3535. Um, where you can actually find those uh, ingredients is usually on the front of the bottle. Uh, I've got a repellent bottle right here. It'll tell you the active ingredient on there. So as long as you pay attention, and you have one of those four, you'll be good to go. Awesome. Thank you for sharing with um, the four main ingredients. Personally, mm -hmm. um, I love the smell of oil of lemon eucalyptus or also known as PMD, but it's kind of harsh on my own skin. So I usually go for something like picaridin or DEET. Those are usually quite nice. Um, does anyone else prefer any other ingredient out there? And just to uh, add on to that, Levy, uh, I think um, we hear DEET so often and I think a lot of people have thought that DEET was our only option. DEET is the most popular and is the gold standard, but all of these um, are just as effective. I myself have always just used DEET just because um, I thought the same thing. It was the only thing available, but I have been using oil of lemon eucalyptus or PMD um, recently as well. Awesome. Now, Same Alan here, Levy. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Same here. Oh, <laughs> so go ahead. Delay. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. Um, I tend to just find um, DEET and oil of lemon eucalyptus in a lot more repellent. So for me, it's just the, the easiness of finding it. Um, and usually you can find it in any outdoors or gardening um, section like of major stores. So that's really helpful as well. Yeah, be sure to pick those up soon. Um, it kind of sucks because our invasive 80s, those black and white mosquitoes, are really active in the fall, but it's really hard to find repellent in the fall. So uh, I hope if any of those repellent manufacturers are out there, please extend out your uh, timeline of those repellents on the shelves because we need them even in the middle of October. So now I have to ask, 
what is the right way of putting on repellent? I can actually show you that. Um, I have Christian here with me who popped in and she doesn't really know how to use repellent. So we're gonna teach her. All right. Well, like I said, you start off by getting a repellent with one of the four main ingredients. Um, and then what you wanna do is you only wanna apply it onto exposed skin. So we're outdoors here actually in Azusa at Lawson Park. And so um, Christian, what we wanna do is you wanna extend your arm, spray, don't over spray, just two sprays is good. One, two. And then you wanna rub it in just like you would with sunblock. And you wanna make sure that you get all exposed skin. So that includes the other arm. One, two, and rub it in. Don't forget the back of your hand. And um, it's also important to get your face also, but we do not want to just spray your face or your neck. So Christian, you wanna make sure that you pour it into your hands and then you can rub it in and you can apply it on your neck. And since we're wearing masks, we can just do it around our masks. So like on our forehead and right here on the sides. you wanna make sure that you avoid um, the eyes and also the mouth. And yeah, I and know that's- and I know for kids, it's especially important. You don't just tell them to close their eyes and spray, right? Yeah, we've seen that. It's terrifying. Do not do that. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. don't want your kids inhaling any of that repellent. It's supposed to go topically on the skin. And I think I read somewhere that uh, for kids, it's ideal to only apply, don't apply it on, the, on their hands because they can stick that in their mouths or on their toys and move that around. So it's best just everywhere else but hands on, on yeah. the skin. An interesting trick is also when you're rubbing it in to rub it with the back of your hands. That way it doesn't get on the front. And then always wash your hands, of course, um, you know, in the front so you don't touch anything. Um, I have a question. Ed. You're out at Slauson Park in Azusa and you're obviously enjoying the nice, almost summer environment or weather. You're yeah. probably <laughs> going to wear sunscreen. So what comes first, sunscreen or repellent? That's a great question. Um, so sunscreen always goes on first. So you apply it like normal, like it says on the sunscreen bottle. And then whenever that's dry, then you go ahead and you apply your repellent over that. Um, and mainly that's because that should be the top layer of anything. Um, you know, I'm also wearing baggy pants, which go cover my ankles. So I'm fine there, but it's always like exposed skin that you want to make sure you put that on top. Well, I'm actually glad you brought up like baggy or loose fitting pants because if it's tight pants, um, I've read that some of these mosquitoes can bite through the pants because it's almost skin tight. Yeah. So it's almost um, perfect for the mosquitoes to get, reach your skin. Yeah, it makes it a little more challenging, but thankfully the fashion lately has had looser pants and clothing. <laughs> so Christian and I are not only trendy, but we're also bite free. So you're telling me I have to ditch my skinny jeans? Sadly, yes. As, as a fellow millennial, it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> All yes. right. Well, yeah, thank you. Oh, you go ahead, Pablo. A quick question on the repellent. What about young uh, children uh, when it comes to mosquito repellent? Oh, you always want to make sure just that you check with their pediatrician. Um, if you want, you can bring in the bottle or you can bring in the information and show the pediatrician that, you know, this is approved by the CDC and recommended and that mosquito control recommended it as well. Get their opinion. You should be fine. Awesome. awesome. Good to <laughs> know. All right. Well, thank you, Christian and Allie, for that demonstration on how to put on repellent and, and, look, and what to look for in repellent um, ingredients. You're welcome. Um, but then now, now begs the question of why do mosquitoes bite in the first place? Um, anyone want to tackle that one? Because I get asked yeah. that a lot. <laughs> mosquitoes actually bite us, only the female mosquitoes, because they want the protein in our blood to make their eggs. And then they'll take that protein and they'll take their egg and they'll actually lay it any place with water, water that has been sitting there stagnant for some time. Um, mosquitoes grow in a week, so they grow really quickly. So you got to make sure that you tip out all of that water and throw away the containers if you're not using them. So you're saying then that every time I get a bite, I'm helping to contribute to more mosquitoes because the female, mos female mosquitoes is using my blood to create more mosquito larvae later on. Yes, to them, that is your sole purpose, just to provide blood. <laughs> and the male mosquitoes don't bite. Uh, they drink plant nectar to survive, much like the female mosquitoes would, but that's about it. They just drink blood, die, and that's their life. Yeah, simple <laughs> cycle of life. 
<laughs> um, but what's dangerous are, are the diseases that they carry when they bite us. Yeah, especially with West Nile virus circulating. So these female mosquitoes could potentially spread West Nile virus um, from birds all and spread it to people. Now with the mosquitoes, um, I don't, I think a lot of people know what the adults look like, but what do the potentially the eggs or even the larvae look like? I can actually share or help you with that, Levy. Um, here I have some under my handy microscope that you can see. Um, what look like what some people have thought um, are tadpoles, they are not tadpoles. These are actually mosquito larvae. Uh, what you're looking at, one is actually uh, having lunch there right now, um, is a mosquito larva. They swim around in any stagnant water and you can see how they move in the water. Um, and that's after they have hatched out of their um, egg casings. And another cool thing to point out is you can see also the size difference in them. Yes, they do grow um, in different instar stages is, which is what we call them. Um, you can see how some are smaller and some are larger and that much larger one is probably just a few, I would say even minutes or um, hours away from turning into pupa. And I don't know if I have any pupa here to show you, but pupa look like little shrimps is the best way I like to describe them or um, the alien from Alien, the movie. Um, <laughs> that's what they really look like. And then after that stage is when they emerge into flying adults. What we're um, do you happen to have any eggs to show in there just so for size comparison of what yes they so out i have you see that little thing that looks like a little poopy thing are um, you able to um use your mouse to kind of circle it for the audience oh yes uh, this thing right here if you can see my mouse right here yeah. um that is uh, an egg raft which uh, to be more specific comes from a Culex mosquito. The Culex mosquitoes are the ones that transmit West Nile virus. And any guesses as to how many eggs we're looking at here in this egg raft? Um, 50? 50, uh, not close. Uh, it's estimated about 150 to 200 uh, uh, mosquito eggs. Um, hatch out of this one egg raft that one mosquito laid. So imagine wow. that that you have a pool or even just a plant saucer. I just have a little tray here uh, with all of these guys, but um, this one egg raft can produce that many, let alone if you have a large water source, like I mentioned, a pool, you're gonna be breeding millions of mosquitoes in a week and that's very dangerous. I think I read somewhere that a swimming pool full of stagnant water that's gone like bad can produce up to 3 million mosquitoes a month. Yeah, that's, that's terrifying. Exactly. And to put it like you briefly mentioned, Levy, uh, this is the Culex mosquitoes that lay these. Now, 80s mosquitoes, which are more nuisance biters, um, they are the ones that lay their eggs on the lie on the edge of the container. And they prefer smaller containers. But the biggest thing that I know we always emphasize this as any stagnant water, even as large as a pool that the pool, the pump is no longer working or um, a bottle cap or plant saucers, anything that can hold water, um, that's what a mosquito is looking for. Well, I'm actually glad you brought up um, a, the 80s mosquitoes. So for those of you watching, this is the bite back tour in the city of Azusa. We're just talking about these creatures called mosquitoes mm -hmm. and their life cycle. And we've been throwing out words like Culex and 80s. So the Culex mosquitoes are, as Paula mentioned, are the ones that can transmit West Nile virus. If you grew up in Azusa, you know them very well. However, in recent years, um, you may have noticed a lot more biting um, and you may have noticed these small black and white mosquitoes. Those are the invasive 80s mosquitoes. They came, um, their, their origin is from tropical climates so they have come over here to Azusa and because many of our front yards and backyards provide a lot of tropical-like environments, these mosquitoes have become a lot more established in your city. And these are the ones that are responsible for biting up your ankles, your calves. I've heard a resident from Azusa say they, they just go out for a quick walk and they come back with bites um, in no time. They are very aggressive biters. I know that from personal experience of 
trying to be healthy and going for a run and I did not put on repellent thinking I'd be safe. And sure enough, I come back and I was covered in three mosquito bites after a short run. Oh, Pablo, you work in mosquito control. You didn't put on repellent. But I learned for sure I cannot <laughs> escape them even if I'm running. <laughs> yeah, you can't escape. You can't run from them. That should be the headline for you 80s. Can't run from the you can't run from these 80s. Um, at least that's not in your own home. I always feel betrayed when I find some in my home and I'm like, hey, I oh. check for stagnant water all the time. That is the worst. When you get one of these 80s mosquitoes inside the home, um, yeah. it is so annoying because there's really no, there's really nothing you can actually do to treat, like spraying something. Uh, it's near impossible. The only thing you can do is just stand there with a fly swatter and just hope you catch it. <laughs> um, so these mosquitoes also, like Pablo mentioned earlier, lay their eggs individually on containers right above the water line. And these containers are can be anything from a bottle cap to a saucer to even a rain barrel. Um, I do believe I see Ali and Christian there. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what you guys got going on back there? Because I'm seeing those horses behind you and it's making me nervous about all those 80s mosquitoes. I know. You have a very good eye, Levy. We actually have a live version of a Spot the Source game from one of our EcoHealth programs. So we've got a bunch of stuff and we need your help. Can Ooh. you guys help us? Absolutely. And if you're just watching us, um, we are in a bite back tour in the city of Azusa. If you want to participate, feel free to add into the comment box, wherever you're watching, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, on our website and help us out. Awesome. Okay. So Christian, let's get started. So what I'll do is I'll wait until Levy Pablo or one of our residents commenting um, can spot a source and then you can go dump them out. See if it has water. All right, guys. Go ahead and start. All right, let's see. see. Right off the bat, a bromeliad, what it looks like there. But I see bromeliads all the time at the store and people always buy them. Um, aren't they good plants to have? Um, actually, yes, that it, bromeliad is a source. Um, we do have passer, people passing by. Oh, they seem to be going away. Okay, that's fine. Christian, let's see if it's a source. Yes, it is. It contains water within its leaves. So you want to make sure that you dump out the water from bromeliads um, each week, or if you can, just get rid of them. All right, what else? I see what looks like um, a yellow green bucket or small bucket. A yellow green bucket. Yes, that is correct, Levy. That is a source. All right. And so is that saucer right next to it. <laughs> anything else if anyone's uh, watching uh please help us out because we can yeah, get them you guys on, are bad sure. at this <laughs> <laughs> shame you work in vector control <laughs> i'm giving our audience a chance so if you're watching in the zoo stuff uh, i'm giving you a chance to, <laughs> to jump in here but i see what looks like um it's in the sun sachet it's kind of blown out i can't see it exactly on the, the children's edge. toys. Ah, yes. That's what it is. This is a tricky one. So anything that can retain even an ounce of water can actually um, grow baby mosquitoes. So you want to make sure, especially when the kids are out playing in the backyard, that they put away their toys. All right. All right. Azusa, help them out. <laughs> <laughs> I see that big... Um, orange looking thing um i think that's a rain barrel um yes. but aren't rain barrels good to have around yes yeah, so the rain barrel is also considered a source because if improperly maintained it can actually hold a bunch of water where mosquitoes will definitely grow so for example christian can you please point to the top of it right there so christian is pointing to it um there are certain like way that the, sh the shape of the rain barrel can retain water and also there is a net on there that if the net has a hole or um, doesn't come with a net that mosquitoes can also fly in there and lay the eggs so you want to make sure that all of the spouts are covered um, or that they have at least a net that way um, water can come out but mosquitoes can't go in and I think it's important to point out too uh, that rain barrels collecting rainwater sh uh, should be used within a week. Um, it's not meant to be a water storage barrel. And if you store water in that rain barrel, it can turn into a huge water quality issue. Um, 
Okay, let's see. I think I see uh, what looks like, is that a metal tin? It's right behind Christian to her left or like something shiny. Is that a watering yeah. can? The shiny things are actually dog bowls. Oh. Um, so they're pet dishes. So you want to make sure that you're always changing out the water. You know, it's good for them to have fresh, clean water every day. Um, but just in case, if you forget, I'm sure it's happened to all of us. You want to make sure that you change the water. That way it's there's fresh water all the time. And then that when you're not using it to also put it away. How about that? That's also still behind Christian. Um, I can't see what that is. It's so in the actually bushes. Two, yeah, there are two objects behind Christian. One of them is like this little spout. I actually don't know what it's called. It's a green spout. Um, but sometimes you can have plants in there or sometimes people put um, just, I don't really know, but it, it retains water. <laughs> yes, plants. And then um, also behind Christian, we have like a plastic white bin. So anything pretty much that holds water sometimes gets lost in our yard. I know it gets lost in mine. So you want to make sure that you're also dumping that out. All right. Good job, guys. I think you're halfway there. Halfway. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's like, we're going to be here for an hour trying to find stuff in this yard. Um, I think I see a big plastic thing uh, to the right of the rain barrel in the bushes. Correct. The white plastic thing is actually... Um, Oh my gosh, watering cans. I couldn't think of it. Yeah, we have two watering cans there and they can also retain water. All right. If you're watching, this is the Bite Back Tour in the city of Azusa. We're actually helping, or we're trying to help out Christian and Ali uh, to identify well. <laughs> these sources. And um, let's see, what else? I, I see I, um, what looks like a lucky bamboo. I know that's a common plant. Uh, people like yeah. to have is we're all lucky bamboo parents but um is that one yes that's one that one is a tricky one because it's um there are plants rooted in water so just changing out the water daily um will really help um keep away mosquitoes um but also don't be fooled just because you have them inside you know an 80s mosquito can fly inside and still lay the their eggs on there also on the plant itself um if you get, you know, certain plants, especially like if you get a plant cutting or just maybe from the store that you bought it from, sometimes they might have um, the 80s eggs on the plant or also on the rim of the container. So it sounds like it's important that you not only toss out the water, if you're going to keep that container, you scrub it. That way you knock off those uh, 80s eggs. Correct, Levy. Yes. Okay. So you're saying uh, you could unwillingly be literally inviting mosquitoes into your home. Literally, that's a great way to phrase it. Yes. Uh, that's, a, a, that's a guess you definitely don't want. Um, let's see. I think I see a drain or like on its side or kind of like a trash or something. Yeah, we actually have two drains right there and also an empty water bottle. So recyclables and drains are also sources. For drains, um, if possible, put some netting over it. Um, that way mosquitoes can't fly in, similar to the rain barrel, um, but you know, it still functions. And then also recyclables. Um, sometimes we leave the cap off or sometimes we just have the plastic bottle caps. We wanna make sure that when you're putting it into the recycle bin, that the recycle bin has a lid also and that you're tossing in in its respective place. Yeah, and also for the drains too, if you can't net it, um, flushing it out regularly does help too. Yes. All right. Uh, Ali, in the interest of time, could you and Christian help us out? <laughs> We're yes. obviously not completing this game very well. I know. <laughs> okay. Well, we also right here have some plant saucers. Yeah. Um, I know at my grandma's house, she actually collects a bunch of plant saucers and will use them, but she keeps them in a cluster. So a lot of clusters of pots or plant saucers um, are not necessarily the best when it comes to protecting yourself from mosquitoes. So making sure that they're flipped over and then also put away somewhere where they can keep they dry. And then also we just have another plant pot and a saucer. Sounds like those plant saucers can be quite the headache in the long run. Yes. All right. So if you're able, how often, Allie, should uh, we be checking for these? Do I have to do this every day? Um, what, what am I looking at here? Yeah, um, thankfully you don't have to do it every day. You can if you'd like, um, but it's only necessary to do it once a week for 10 minutes a day. Just go out and check your yard. 
Um, I recommend just to do it on trash day. I'm out anyways, forcefully, you know, throwing out my trash. So I just take a quick second as I'm pulling the trash can outside, you know, to make sure that I've dumped everything out as well. Okay. And you said that this ties into eco health in the curriculum. I guess, Christian, yes. you, might, you might be the, I see you transported back to another location. Could you tell us a little bit about how what we just did um, is what students may experience? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I have special skills today to <laughs> go around everywhere, uh, which is kind of what we do in the escape room. We're able to jump from one place to the next and really trying to solve um, these vector borne disease outbreaks. Um, and that's, that's what our, all of our programs are all about is trying to get students to um, think about vector borne disease in a way that ties to the standards. So that's super important. We definitely want um, our our programs and our teachers to feel like, you know, when um, the education specialists are coming in, they're going to connect it to the things that we're learning in the classroom. So um, yeah, so we have our classroom programs. Those are our K through 12 and GSS aligned programs, virtual or in person, we'll go in and we'll, uh, you know, have a lot of fun with your students. And we also have our citizen science programs. And so those are um, our vector inspector program, VIP and operation mosquito grid, grid standing for um, growth reduction and increased detection of mosquitoes. Uh, so that's what we do in our eco health programs. It's really fun. Students really enjoy them um, because they get to learn science in a brand new way and get to engage and also be able to give uh, to public health, right? And giving us data that they're able to learn and, um, and apply at home. And then uh, we, with the older students, we are able to have them analyze the data that the younger kids provide to us. So it's super fun. Wow. Um, if teachers are interested, one way that they can find us is through our uh, vectoreducation.org website. So when they get on there, they'll be able to click through all of the different options and see what program meets their needs. That is so cool. I wish I had this as a kid. All I got were workbooks and a rolling museum of insect boxes that we just walked by and that was about it. Right? I mean, I wish <laughs> I was doing this. It would be so much fun. I think I would have become a vector ecologist um, in my other life if I would have gotten <laughs> into this. So um, super cool, super fun. Um, the kids love it. And the teachers of Azusa, please come onto our website, check us out. Um, if you have questions, feel free to contact us, but we are here for you. And I don't want to forget um, those of us who, teachers are, are potentially now on vacation, well-deserved vacation, but um, there are also summer programs and, um, you know, people who run like extracurricular activities, we can also support you. So please feel free to contact us check out our page and ask any questions that you have. And Chris, right, thank quick, you. quick question on that uh, for teachers. Our teachers are overworked and they've been through a crazy last year, academic year. Um, as a teacher, does this require extra work on their end? Ooh, great question. As a teacher, I know that you already have a million things going on and you're like, oh my gosh, one more Thing to add to my plate but no our goal is to make this as easy for you as possible so tell us the date tell us what you're looking for whichever program it is that you want and we are we'll do the heavy lift, lifting we will do as much as we can to make this like a seamless process for you so um our our curriculum is already created so we will just come and implement and you can uh just you know learn something new with your students that sounds so cool. Even great for a teacher who just wants to sit back, relax, and learn something new and exciting about mosquitoes. Yeah, I think teachers usually are not the sit back and relaxing type, but at least <laughs> you can do it for a little bit of time. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you for sharing that really fun experience. Uh, hopefully next time we'll do better and faster um, at finding the sources. And if I was going to say, for the students, I believe in you. You can do better than we do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ali. Um, if you're just watching this, the Bite Back Tour in the city of Azusa, um, let's talk about some other things you might see in Azusa. Black flies. Uh, you may not know them as black flies. You may think, what are those? Are those the house flies? No, these are the small 
versions of a housefly. At least they look like small versions of a housefly. And they are notorious for biting you up, especially around your face, your neck, around the, the hat line where you may wear your hat. And we know a lot of people in Azusa are affected by these black, black flies, especially if they live near any natural running water like streams, or if they have any kind of water fountain that's continuously running. So black flies are unique uh, or different compared to mosquitoes. Black flies require running water in order to survive. So they have their, their eggs that they lay um, in the water then they have the larval uh, form. Um, Paula, I don't know if you can use your mouse to circle. Yeah, there we go. Uh, where they attach themselves to any uh, surface where water can run over them and they actually eat whatever comes by, the, comes by them. So if you, and then eventually they do hatch out, uh, eventually they do grow into um, flying, biting adult um, black flies. If you want to avoid this, we recommend everyone, if you have any running water features, turn them off for one day, one 24 hour cycle, so that it will basically kill off these black flies and then turn it back on again to prevent mosquitoes from growing. All right, so that's just a little black fly segment. But now I, I can't help but look at the background for Christian and Allie and notice there's a lot of plants, a lot of ivy and dense vegetation. And this definitely plays into mosquitoes um, lurking around in your yards. Does anyone know how that plays into it all? Hi, Levy. Yeah, um, it's actually a good thing that we've applied repellent just now um, because mosquitoes like to rest in very dense and shady areas. Um, Similar to us, you know, when it's hot outside, we, they can't handle the heat also. So they need a place to rest um, and, you know, relax in order to, you know, have that, that energy to come out and bite us basically. So um, having stuff like this, there's a lot of resting spots for them to choose from here. Um, and especially with the sources that you just cleaned out, like that was a perfect place for them to not only hang out, have their blood meal, but also to lay their eggs. So you have to make sure that you um, not only get rid of your stagnant water, and that you apply repellent, but also that you trim down stuff that way airflow can go through them. Right, yeah, and just being really clear, mosquitoes are not going to grow behind me, right, in these beautiful bushes, um, but they are going to rest there. So, um, and thank you, Allie, for, you know, giving me some repellent, because now I'm ready to, uh, to be here all, as long as I can. <laughs> but yes, it's really important to, especially like underneath, you'll see um, there might be some leaves or different things that are creating that moist atmosphere. If you have sprinklers and you have leaves and then you have a dense bush. Um, so clearing all that out so that there is a lot of airflow um, and mosquitoes are not really great flyers. Um, and so that it's going to make them hard. It's going to make it hard for them to be able to uh, feel like they're in a restful place if there's air. Oh, very good points. Um, and then, so if they take that out, if, if I were a homeowner and I trim that back and I rip it out, what can I use instead then? Is this just gonna be dirt? No, actually, um, that's a good question. A lot of people think, you know, they have to have just this very boring, ugly yard. That's not true, actually. Uh, a good thing to have is just tap into our local environment, things that thrive here, uh, just like California native plants. There are so many beautiful California native plants. Um, one of my favorites, I don't know the name of it, but it's purple and it's very similar to lavender actually. So they're very colorful and um, you can actually have more clusters of those. So it looks very um, lush and lovely, but they're also bite free. Oh, good to know. So California native plants is definitely a good alternative to the tropical jungle that we plant here in Azusa. Cause I know the eighties mosquitoes love Azusa because of all the dense vegetation. Um, all right, let's go ahead, pivot over to just other things that residents can do in addition to dumping out stagnant water, tossing out containers and protecting themselves. And that is join us in our Bite Back program. If you want to rally your neighbors together, we're here to help you out. Uh, we've had many Bite Back groups pop up over the past year throughout San Gabriel Valley. And we want to have more Bite Back groups here in Azusa. So to sign up, and if you're interested in collaborating with us, we can meet with your neighbors, do property inspections, 
Uh, it, it all depends on what you need as, as a neighborhood. Uh, you can contact us on bitebackchampion.org um, or you can call, I think Pablo, there should be a slide, I believe with a number. Yes, that. I'm getting it up right now. So we can either contact us or sign up at, SG, um, at or I'm sorry, bitebackchampion.org or our main website there. You can call us at 626-814-9466 or you can email us at outreach at sgvmosquito.org to find out more information about how to sign up to be a Bite Back Champion. So at this point, uh, if you're just watching us, you're probably on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, or on our website. This is the Bite Back Tour in the city of Azusa. We're about wrapped up here. So thank you all so much for joining us. We're gonna go through a quick round of last um, takeaways. So I'm gonna start with um, Pablo. Any uh, words to our viewers in Azusa? Yes, we had a lot of great information shared today on uh, repellent, on how to look for mosquitoes. And a simple way that we have simplified that whole process is simply tip, tip out the stagnant water, toss, toss any used containers, and protect by using mosquito repellent. So just remember, when you hear mosquitoes, think tip, toss, protect, and that's your key to mosquito prevention. I love it. And then Allie. Hi everyone. Um, my key takeaway is to mainly um, make sure that once a week you're going outside for 10 minutes um, to check for any stagnant water that you have around your home. And also, um, if you happen to be out and about, be very observant. Your community is your safe space, the place that you really want to um, take ownership of. So just to make sure that, you know, you're calling us if you see a source, um, you know, a bigger, more permanent source. And also to wear repellent when you guys are outside. Thank you, Ali. And then Christian. Yeah, my message is to um, the teachers and um, extracurricular educators, um, please feel free to contact us at vectoreducation.org. Um, this is our nifty little vehicle that we uh, that you might see us traveling in, but we are uh, ready to help you, um, you know, enhance your programs. So please feel free to contact us. Thank you, Christian. And with that, that rounds out our Bite Back Tour in the city of Azusa. Thank you for watching. Everyone, please stay healthy and stay bite free.